Hi, Misha here, and kind of continuing our buyer's guide or buying 101 series. Posted a look at Arasaka's recently, and that pretty much right away led to two or three questions about Japanese pistols. Specifically, blah, blah, specifically there we go, the Nambu. And uh, Jay's not here, and I figured since it's a pistol, I'll give it a try. I'm not going to get way wrapped up in the details, because, yeah, you can go really long, and we've done that in the past. But just some basics and what to maybe look for and look out for. So to that end, I brought out an early 1930s production example, kind of the first pattern. Then uh, an early pre-war wartime example. And then, kind of an early, late war example, as funny as that might sound. And then finally, a last year. This isn't what you'd really consider a last ditch, to be fair, so I don't want to call it that. But it is the last kind of variation that came out of the factory. And originally I was just going to do the video on the Type 14 that you see here. But, I realized that a major question is what's the difference between the Type 14 and the Type 94? So if I left the 94 out, it really would kind of avoid a major difference. So, I brought a relatively early production, 94 out, and a relatively late production, 94 out. These are the most common sidearms for the Japanese military during World War II. They fire 8 by 52 which was a little bottleneck cartridge that dates back to the turn of the century. Colonel Nambu used it in his original so-called grandpa, although it was just called the 1903, excuse me, 1902. Also, the Papa Nambu, the modified 1902, which was adopted by the Japanese Navy, but only in small numbers. It's worth pointing out that in the Japanese military, much like some European militaries, officers were expected to buy their own pistols. Only NCOs and a few others were actually issued pistols, at least until the end of World War II. To that end, officers could select from a number of approved pistols that the military had to offer. And of course, the wealthier, wealthier the officer, the higher standing, the nicer pistol they could buy. And oftentimes this would be foreign guns because Japan would subsidize domestic guns like the Nambu pistols, meaning that they were quite a bit cheaper. Now, kind of the exception to this would be the baby Nambu, which was quite expensive, but that was uh, never at all a standard. So the Type 14 actually... Kajiro Nambu started working on an improved version of his original model in 1916, but he retired in 1924 before this was officially completed. It was actually completed in 1925 by committee. One of the last things they added was this manual safety. 1925 was the 14th year of the reign of the Taisho Emperor, which is the 14 in Type 14. But it actually wouldn't go into production that year. It just was adopted. It started to be produced at a subsidiary of Nagoya in late 1926. However, at the end of December, the emperor died, so production was suspended for a brief time. It picked back up in 1927, in February which was technically the 
second year of the reign of his son, Hirohito. Because even though it was his, the first year was only a few days, it still counted. So the earliest production you're going to find is with a two date. There are some 15 dates from the original emperor, but again, I don't want to talk too much about it. Next up for production, it would start in 1928 at the Tokyo Arsenal. And then in 1932, after some experiences using this in China, there would be the Great Recall, which fitted a magazine disconnect safety, and they tried to improve an issue with the firing pin. These are striker-fired guns, so they have the problems that striker-fired guns can have. So after that great recall, you had a few changes. And one of the first things to note, the date is easily found on a Nambu pistol. It'll be on the side. For example, the 10th year would be 1935, so 10. You basically take the number and add it to the year 1925 to get it. And then the months are very easy, 1 January, 12 December. So dating these is, is very easy. In the 1930s, you'd have a lot of production changes. Uh, another assembly line would be opened up. Actually, I should say the one at the Nagoya uh, factory would close. It would be taken over by, actually, Kaijo and Ambu's company at Koki Bungie. And then Tokyo's production would transition over to Kokora. But they actually wouldn't build them very long. They would build some from Tokyo parts and then some from their own parts. But before long, by 1936, you basically had the Kakibunji factory making Type 14s for the military. And they were the only provider until 1941. So not a high rate thing, but of course at this time... They were only fighting in China, and again, officers could opt to buy their own pistols, but it was as close as really could be expected as standard issue. In 1939, quite late in the year, they would go to the enlarged, sometimes called a winter or Kiska trigger guard. As you can tell, it's just a bulged out guard from the original. That's one of the earliest major variations. They also would go to a new pattern of lines on the grips, taking off the top grooves. And then at the end of 1939, they would add this magazine retention spring at the front of the grip strap. Early versions did not have it, and they had effectively a drop-free magazine. But soldiers were sometimes accidentally hitting it and losing their mag. Because they do slide in and out very easily. These early ones especially because they have a nickel coating. They're very slick. Quite cool. They would continue using nickel mags after the spring was introduced for a time. So there is a small transitional period where you can have a large trigger guard and no spring. But... It's only a couple of months. It's also worth pointing out this spring can be broken or otherwise damaged. If you're looking to buy a pistol, check that out. I'm not saying avoid it if it's broken, but just know that replacing it is quite difficult because it's riveted from the inside. So definitely use that as a buying point if you wish. It will still work without it, but it might be cosmetically ugly. The magazines hold eight rounds. They are serial numbered to the gun. You can check on the back spine of the mag. There will also be a factory symbol or proof code. This has a rear cocking knob, a fixed lanyard loop in the back, fixed rear sight, drift adjustable front sight. The barrel 
is 4.6 inches. Overall length is 9 inches. Single action only trigger. And it weighs right at 2 pounds unloaded. It's a relatively svelte, although quite large gun. In fact, it's technically longer than a US 1911. Early guns, pre-war, have a nice high-grade blued finish with good metal polishing underneath. They also are known for having very nice triggers. That's one of the benefits of a striker system. They had hand-lacquered grips, Euroshi lacquer. Different factories had different groove patterns and stuff, but they all were grooved this early on. A lot of the small parts, including the bolt, had a very attractive straw finish. And then in 1941, the Kaki Benji factory would finish the No Series block. Uh, the Japanese military, the Japanese government, did not want serial numbers over five digits. So once they hit 99,999, typically 100,000 pistols, they had to roll over to a Series 1. So this happened in late 1941, prior to Pearl Harbor. And because they knew what was coming, they started a second production line at the Toriyamatsu factory, which was again under Nagoya supervision. And the first series would be split between the two factories. Throughout 1942, some changes would be made. For one, they would go to a blued magazine in 1941. Uh, Kaki Bungie pretty much kept making pistols the same way, although the hand lacquering of the wood grips would, would fall away. The bluing, of course, would deteriorate a bit, but they kept a standard. But Toriyamatsu would actually make some changes, simplifications. One early one they did, they went to grinding the trigger pin flush with the frame there. Interestingly, they did improve the firing pin and striker system further, like it had been done in 1932, trying to increase reliability. Nevertheless, these were still not all that reliable at least comparatively speaking. And so even to the end of the war, Type 14s were all issued with spare firing pins, just in case. That's kind of the issue with anything striker fired. They would keep the enlarged trigger guard. More and more parts would go to being blued. As you notice, the Tori Matsu pistol has the lines up to the top of the grip. At the end of 1943, they would finish at Torimatsu with their assigned block for Series 1, and so they would progress on to Series 2, but Kaki Bungie would not. In fact, they only made about 20,000 pistols in Series 1, and Kaki Bungie would suspend their production in the summer of 1944. But Toriyamatsu would continue. And at the beginning of that year, they would introduce simplifications. They would simplify the rear sight notch. And they would also shorten it a bit, making it easier to machine. They would also go to this round cocking knob, checkered knob. It's the same basic part. It's just not as finely machined. They save some steps. You notice here on the top, it's it's flat and grooved. It's got groove in the back. And this is pretty well smooth except for checkering. It's also worth pointing out that this is a serialized part. So if you lose it, it's missing. Replacements are hard to find, and if you do, they will not match. 
early on, the bluing would still be okay. It was still military grade. But more and more final polishing would be skipped to get these out the door as quick as possible. And of course the blowing and all that would go down a bit as well. But the same basic model is still the same. 8-shot mag, 4.6 inch barrel. There's really no variations. And that gets us to our final model here. With the major difference being the uh, wood grips on this one. After Chucky Bungie would go out of production, Toriyamatsu would start looking for more ways to simplify production. And one way was introduced in November of 1944 were these slab wood grips. Essentially, they're just ungrooved. But because they're not grooved, they do have a propensity to crack, split, and otherwise deform. And it could also just be that the quality of the wood went down. But oftentimes when you find these later guns, the grips are damaged in some way. And of course the bluing would continue to degrade. And there would be lots of leftover machine marks. Like as you see on this one. But they were still reliable. Pistols, for the most part, endurable enough, except for the grips. Let me see. Should have grabbed one. So I've got some I'm looking for here. And of course I didn't. <laughs> I was going to say, one thing to look for is the way the safety is made. It is going to scribe an arc in your gun. In the finish, that's just unavoidable. But one thing people send them to do, they over rotate it, cutting it down into the grip, and it'll make an arc into the top of the grip here, corner. And I've seen some of these just huge get cut out. That's some some place to look for. That'll tell you how much the safety's been moved and and whatnot. Production would continue more or less unchanged at Toriyamatsu until June of 1945. And then in July and August, they would start what we consider true last-ditch production. By this, I mean a lot of the serializing of parts was skipped. A lot of proof testing was skipped. And a lot of leftover parts were used from the old Cocky Bungie factory. Uh, previously rejected parts were used. Even parts from pistols that were returned from being damaged in the field. They basically were throwing pistols together in July and August of 1945, however they could. On top of that, a lot of the previously skilled labor had been conscripted to the army, meaning the people at the factory, for the most part, were old, young, women, otherwise maimed, yeah, and just didn't have the experience level. So with the true last it's pistols, you can find wild variations. Even some that weren't completely finished out, blued, what have you. And then of course type 14 production would end with the end of the war. We don't know exactly how many were made. Estimates are between 279,000 and 282,000. So, you know, 280,000 is a good estimate. Not a huge number, considering the numbers of pistols that the other powers made during the war, but it is still the most produced pistol in Japan up to that point. So, by Japanese standards, it was. It was built at a total of five factories under the supervision of three arsenals. It was produced nearly continuously from the end of 1926 
until the beginning of August 1945, so a near 19-year run. And as I was saying, originally officers would buy their pistols. Well, as access to foreign pistols deteriorated and as more and more officers were needed, in 1943, Japan changed things, the, the army. And so pistols started to be issued. And that's right when really Type 14 production was ramped up. You had two factories building them, with Toriyamatsu really cranking them out. So that's why you... The most common ones are going to be 1943 and 1944. So they're going to be Showa 18 and Showa 19 dated pistols. There are also a number of serial numbers on these guns to look for. The barrel assembly, the frame. The trigger will have a serial number, which is part of the pack. The bolt, the locking block, and various other parts most notably the magazine. So just things to, to look for. Well, with that said, what about its little brother, the Type 94? Well, the Type 94 was designed by Kajiro Nabu and actually designed very quickly. As I said, he retired. He opened his own factory in 1933 with production of the Type 14, his main priority. Well, in 1934, colleagues and friends of his in the Japanese military government approached him and basically asked if he could make a pistol to improve upon at the Type 14 to be more durable, reliable, kind of correct some of its issues. It also would be more compact, lighter, and faster, cheaper, easier to mass produce. Well, in Lambu, with years of experience with pistols, kind of skipped the prototype and sketching phase. He pretty much just made a prototype. He showed it to the powers that be at the end of 1934, and it was accepted and ordered into military service, becoming the Type 94. For the 94th year, or rather, 2,594th year of the Japanese Empire, according to legend. <laughs> but it didn't go into production that year. It took time to set up the facilities. And the first pistols were turned out in June of 1935, dated 10.6. So what do we have here? This was kind of designed initially and originally for uh, vehicle crews, pilots, tank drivers, etc. To that end, it is quite a bit smaller. It's 7 inches long, so 2 inches shorter than the Type 14. But we didn't sacrifice that much in barrel length, whereas the Type 14 had a 4.6. This has about a 3.8 inch barrel so shorter but you know not bad it does have a shortened grip as well very similar mag design to the 14 at least overall but it holds six cartridges and a smaller grip it has bakelite type grip panels rather than wood And it weighs right at one and a half pounds unloaded, so saving about a half pound of weight. To try to get better reliability and durability, it got away from using the striker firing system to more of a hammer firing system, which was indeed much more durable. He also added a firing pin spring for additional safety, 
and it retains the magazine disconnect. The only downside to these changes, the awesome trigger of the Type 14 is gone. The trigger on this is military. And also you have this exposed sear bar on the side here, which was necessary for the small size and just how it was. It uses a fixed iron sights, pretty basic. Same kind of rear cocking knob system as the 14, and same style of mag release. Also like the 14, it will hold open when empty, but it's actually held open by the magazine follower. So on both guns, once you pull the magazine out, the bolt will slam forward. Unfortunately, this gun is really a pain in the ass to disassemble. It is one of the most unusual military guns for disassembly. But anywho, this went into production in 1935, but the rate was very low for the first several years. I do have a 1937 gun, but I decided to bring this one out instead. It really wasn't until 1940 that they decided to kind of increase the rate production and when they did that, they also eliminated some pretty unnecessary machining steps. For example, they started not machining this, leaving kind of a square bottom to the frame. Some things like that, just to speed stuff up. They kept the nickel magazines, blued. Finish was still very nice. Small parts were strawed. So you had a, a production increase in 1940. These were only built at the Cocky Bungie factory, which had was operating under Nagoya supervision and also had some assistance from the Tokyo Arsenal on these. And even though these have a different recoil system, the Type 14 has two small springs. This has a spring around the barrel, kind of more conventional style. They both still fire the 8mm bottleneck Nambu round. Of course, after World War II kicked off, there was another production increase in 1942. And this is when they started to eliminate more steps to speed up manufacture. For example, they would get away from using the nickel magazines and go to blued mags. And then in 1943, more and more of the small parts would cease to be straw colored and go to just straight bluing. And then in 1943 into 44, the finish would continue to be more and more reduced. <laughs> with polishing reduced. And then in uh, around July of 1944, these slab wood grips replace the Bakelite ones. This is the most noticeable change in Type 94 production. But there would be others. For example, at the beginning of 1945, the relatively nicely machined, dished out caulking knob would be changed. Also, the uh, kind of L-shaped rear sights, they would go to what is known as a square back, essentially an uncut knob, which is some basic patterning on it. there and the, the rear sight would soon after kind of go to just being two small posts even after these changes they would even later on with some pistols go to what are called short grips 
They would move the screw higher up on the frame so they could use smaller pieces of wood. They would even simplify the magazine going to a simple round thing. Still have the serial of the gun on it though. Here's the mag out of this one. Just so you see it. Sorry, it's greasy. Hands are slipping. See so yeah, how this is much more ornate. Also, they early in production added this reinforcing ridge to the bottom of the mag. Light ones would still have it. But yeah, even the mags were simplified. Along with the Type 14, as things changed in the war, these would be issued more than purchased. And they would continue manufacturing, they would continue production. At least main production until June of 1945, at which time they just really could not keep making them. They didn't have the resources, the manpower, and continual bombings of the home islands. They pretty much devastated Japanese industry. Nevertheless, there would be a short phase of so-called Last Ditch 94 production, where they would assemble them using leftover, damaged, rejected parts at the end of June and a little bit into the beginning of July. But these would cease to be built shortly before the 14 was taken out of production. And since only one factory built these, and since the initial five years or so were pretty low rate production, they only produced about 71 to 72,000, which is still more than the Type 26 Japanese revolver, so. Unlike with the Type 14, there's not as much to look for with the 94s. They are a more solidly built pistol. Probably the most commonly missing or broken part is this safety. Because it's at the end of the sear bar. So that can be bent outwards or damaged. Sometimes I've seen the lanyard and ring clipped off the back as well. Of course, the whole suicide pistol thing is as well known today thanks to the internet. See, the internet does have some good aspects. It is complete bunk. This was just the design. It's just It was just the design thing. That was never used for suicide or to fake surrender. And I could never find any reports of Japanese actually accidentally shooting themselves with it because you really have to press in on it. In any way, they would usually carry it with the safety on, which physically blocks it. So, yeah, not really a true concern when the pistol was carried and operated properly. So these have been more maligned. They're actually quite good pistols, at least in terms of durability. They have a relatively small grip. But it was well suited for the Japanese hand. It also meant it was a much easier gun to, you know, carry without getting in your way if you were in the tight, cramped cockpit of a Japanese Zero or a Japanese tank. And it is actually very ergonomically, very curvy in the shape for that era. About as good as ergonomics got. And it did fire seven rounds total of the standard 8mm cartridge. So yeah, kind of gets an unfair reputation, but so does the Type 14. 
There's more to look for when buying these to make sure they're not damaged or missing parts. But on the other hand, these are known for being very accurate guns for being military pistols. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of just a basic guide to the Japanese Nambu. The ones you're most likely to encounter. Prices really are over the place with these. I can't even give estimates depending on all the variations. I will say though, if you find one that seems like a good deal, but it's missing a magazine or other parts, be wary because you're not going to find much. About the only one I know who's making good reproduction parts is Don Schlickman. And uh, his work is good and actually very fairly priced considering how much energy goes into it, but even that is not inexpensive. So just something to be mindful of. My point is, these aren't super expensive, so it's probably worth holding out for a working example versus trying to buy a parts gun and hoping to restore it. Plus, with all the serial numbers and grip-specific and factory-specific things, the chances of getting it restored to look proper are pretty low. But yeah, when I did the Arasaka video, there were questions about Nambus, so I hope maybe this answered some of them. If you still would like to know more about Nambus, we have videos about it in the playlist. It goes even into more detail. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. With that said, this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.